Hey, welcome back. We are almost done with The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. And uh, I figured if you guys want, we'll just keep doing an, another book next time, uh, once we finish this book, I mean. And uh, if you want, just leave a comment in the comments about what book you'd like to hear read next. Um, it could be a deeper book. Um, it could be by C.S. Lewis. It could be by somebody else. I just figured that if you enjoy this, I'll just keep it going. It's, it's kind of a fun thing to do. But for now, let's continue with The Great Divorce. We're in chapter 13. I do not know that I ever saw anything more terrible than the struggle of that dwarf ghost against joy. For he had almost been overcome somewhere incalculable ages ago. There must have been gleams of humor and reason in him. For one moment, while she looked at him in her love and mirth, he saw the absurdity of the tragedian. For one moment, he did not at all misunderstand her laughter. He too must have known that no people find each other more absurd than lovers. But the light that reached him reached him against his will. This was not the meeting he had pictured. He would not accept it. Once more he clutched at his death line, and at once the tragedian spoke. You dare to laugh at it, he stormed, to my face. And this is my reward? Very well. It is unfortunate that you give yourself no concern about my fate. Otherwise you might be sorry afterward. To think that you had driven me back to hell. What? Do you think I'd stay now? Thank you. I believe I'm fairly quick at recognizing where I'm not wanted. Not needed was the exact expression, if I remember rightly. From this time on, the dwarf never spoke again, but still the lady addressed it. Dear, no one sends you back. Here is all joy. Everything bids you stay. But the dwarf was growing smaller even while she spoke. Yes, said the tragedian, on terms you might offer to a dog. I happen to have some self-respect left. I see that my going will make no difference to you. It is nothing to you that I go back to the cold and the gloom, the lonely, lonely streets. Don't, don't, Frank, said the lady. Don't let it talk like that. But the dwarf was now so small that she had dropped on her knees to speak to it. The tragedian caught her words greedily as a dog catches a bone. Ah, you can't bear to hear it? He shouted with miserable triumph. That was always you. You must be sheltered. Grim realities must be kept out of your sight. You who can be happy without me, forgetting me. You don't want to hear of my sufferings. You say, don't. Don't tell you. Don't make you unhappy. Don't break in on your sheltered, self-centered little heaven. And this is the reward. She stooped still lower to speak to the dwarf, which was now a figure no bigger than a kitten, hanging on the end of the chain with his feet off the ground. And that is, wasn't why I said don't, she answered. I meant stop acting. It's no good. He is killing you. Let go of that chain even now. Act! said the tragedian. What do you mean? The dwarf was now so small that I could not distinguish him from the chain to which he was clinging, and now for the first time I could not be certain whether the lady was addressing him or the tragedian. Quick, she said, there is still time. Stop it. Stop it at once. Stop what? Using pity, other people's pity, in the wrong way. We have all done it a bit on earth. You know, pity was meant to be a spur that drives joy to help misery, but it can be used the wrong way around. It can be used for a kind of blackmailing. Those who choose misery can hold joy up to ransom by pity, 
You see, I know now, even as a child, you did it. Instead of saying you were sorry, you went and sulked in the attic. Because you knew that sooner or later one of your sisters would say, I can't bear to think of him sitting up there alone crying. You used your pity to blackmail them, and you and they gave in in the end. And afterwards, when we were married, oh, it doesn't matter if only you would stop it. And that, said the tragedian, that is all you have understood of me after all of those years. I don't, I don't know what had become of the dwarf ghost by now. Perhaps it was climbing up the chain like an insect. Perhaps it was somehow absorbed into the chain. No, Frank, not here, said the lady. Listen to reason. Did you think joy was created to live always under the, that threat? always defenseless against those who would rather be miserable than have their own self-will crossed for it was a real misery i know that now you made yourself really wretched that you can still do but you can no longer communicate your wretchedness everything becomes more and more itself here is joy that cannot be shaken our light can swallow up your darkness but your darkness cannot now infect our light no 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 come to us we will not go to you can you really have thought that love and joy would always be at the mercy of frowns and sighs did you not know they were stronger than the opposites love how dare you use that sacred word, said the tragedian. At the same moment, he gathered up the chain, which had now for some time been swinging uselessly at his side, and somehow disposed of it. I'm not quite sure, but I think he swallowed it. And then for the first time it became clear that the lady saw and addressed him only. Where is Frank? she said. And who are you, sir? I never knew you. Perhaps you had better leave me, or stay if you prefer. If it would help you, and if it were possible, I would go down with you into hell. But you cannot bring hell into me. You do not love me, said the tragedian in a thin, bat-like voice. He was now very difficult to see. I cannot love a lie, said the lady. I cannot love the thing which is not. I am love, and out of it I will not go. There was no answer. The tragedy had vanished. The lady was alone in her wooded place, and a brown bird went hopping past her, bending with its light feet the grasses I could not bend. Presently, the lady got up and began to walk away. The other bright spirits came forward to receive her, singing as they came, and I apologize for my singing. The happy trinity is her home, nothing can trouble her joy. She is the bird that evades every nest, the wild deer that leaps every pitfall. Like the mother bird to its chickens, or a shield to the armed knight, so it is the lord to her mind in his unchanging lucidity. Bogies will not scare her in the dark. Bullets will not frighten her in the day. Falsehoods tricked out as truths assail her in vain. She sees through the lie as if it were glass. The invisible germ will not harm her, nor yet the glittering sunstroke. A thousand fail to solve the problem. Ten thousand choose the wrong turning. But she passes safely through. He details immortal gods to attend her upon every road where she must travel. They take her hand at hard places she will not stub her toes in the dark. She may walk among lions and rattlesnakes, among dinosaurs and nurseries of lionettes. 
He fills her brimful with immensity of life and leads her to see the world's desire. And that's where we're going to stop today, right in the middle of chapter 13. We'll see you next week.